Shalom, and welcome to another edition of Parsha Talk. I'm Rabbi Elliot Malamud in Highland Park, New Jersey, at the Highland Park Conservative Temple Congregation on Shem. And joining me, as always, my good friends, Rabbi Barry Chesler, Solomon Schechter, Day School Long Island, Rabbi Jeremy Kalmanovsky, Anshay Chesed in New York City. It's great to see you. We're recording this on Shem Rabbi Thomas, so forgive us if we have a little less energy. Pinchas is our Parsha. We are going to go right into it. Pinchas ben Alazar says the Parsha, Ben Aaron HaKohen, Yeshiv Chamati. Wow, he, he does something. And you mentioned this, I think, at the end of last week's Parsha talk, Jeremy Kalmanovsky. What did Pinchas do? Why did he do it? And why is he getting rewarded for this? Tell us a little about that. Well, I think it's a little ambiguous, actually, because Pinchas, at, at the end of the last passage, you know, the Moabites and their cousins, the Midianites, they were they were trying to entrap the Israelites and they tried to do it with a curse from Bilam. That didn't work. And so then what comes at the end of the parasha is this kind of orgy, orgiastic moment in which the the Israelite men seem to be sleeping with the Midianite women and Pinchas in a righteous rage and a moment of vigilantism uh, takes takes a spear and kills these two people with a single spear blow. And, uh, and that seems to bring an end to this like gross display of apostasy and, and just otherwise terrible behavior. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an act of outrageous zealotry. Like, you know, the rabbis, and so, so the beginning of our parasha comes along and ostensibly in praise, it says, as, as Elliot just read, uh, God says that Pinchas, uh, when Pinchas expressed my rage, um, I therefore did not destroy the people in my, God says, in my jealousy. Pinchas becomes this kind of vessel for the divine fury. And, you know, I think... Uh, Chazalenu, our sages of blessed memory, were fundamentally uh, moderate people, and they, uh, as they will say, Pinchas shelobiratzon chachamim. Pinchas's behavior was not did not meet what we what we uh, what we the sages we who, we who like to dis discuss we who like to argue we who like to persuade. Uh, we're not crazy about spearing people. This is not this is not the uh, the religion that the rabbis have bequeathed to us. And so they, of course, are not capable of, of saying, wow, we just really disagree with the Torah. That's, that's not in the rabbinic register, but they, they read that his zeal was just very, very excessive. And uh, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm kind of with them. You know, there's, Pinchas is given, Briti Shalom, my covenant of peace. You could read that ambivalently and say, um, the blessing for you, my friend, is a little bit more peaceful behavior. Indeed. Barry, you make the point that the Parsha starts at a certain point. I mean, and, and I want you to talk about this for a second. The break of the Parsha between last week's Parsha and this week's Parsha. It's, you know, the rabbis arbitrarily broke the Parsha. And what do you think the meaning of the, the, the end of last week's Parsha and the beginning of this week's Parsha at that particular point is? So... You know, as, as Jews following the synagogue tradition, we read the Parsha every week, I hope. And we often don't read books in their entirety in one or two sittings. And we lose things. But here what happens is the story that Jeremy described of the orgy and the killing of the two people in the sacred precincts happened last week. And the story actually continues in what we call chapter 25 of Numbers this week. And here, Pinchas is just a recipient of the divine blessing. He doesn't actually do anything. And it's interesting to note that the death of the two people is described in the passive, Muka and Huka. They are wounded or, or struck, not by Pinchas. Pinchas isn't mentioned as the agent, so he could be, in a sense, rehabilitated a little bit by divorcing him from the deed, which is described as kina, zealotry or, uh, or, or jealousy. But I want to take issue a little bit with what Jeremy said, because I think we always have to ask ourselves, what was the alternative? 
if Pinchas had not acted, what would have happened? In a situation like this, if we're imagining a plague of divine um, origin happening, until this action stops, the plague is going to continue. So if Pinchas wouldn't have acted, more people would have died in the plague, I would think. And I was struck listening to you that it, it seems almost reminiscent of the Uza story, which we talked about with um, in Parsha Shmini, where Uza is punished for stopping the ark from falling. And I think the question we always have to ask ourselves, well, if he had let it fall, would that have been better? And I think the issue that most of us have is we think it would not have been better for the ark to fall. Here, I think it would not necessarily have been better for Pinchas not to act as terrible as his act was. I see you shaking your head, so I know you want to respond. I do. Um, I, I, I'm coming at it from a different perspective. First of all, I would describe the Uza story and perhaps the Nadav and Avihu story that it's brought to, uh, to a company as tragedies. Something very painful had to happen, but not necessarily as punishments. Um, Uza is the guy who goes into the nuclear reactor to clean it up. He knows it's going to kill him, but the job has to be done. Um, in this case, I think that the rabbis who live in, a, in the immediate aftermath of um, first the Great Revolt of 70 CE and then Bar Kokhba in, in 132 CE, they, they are not unfamiliar with actual violent religious zealotry. And and uh, I think that they're contending with not only the interpretation of a single Bible story, which takes into consideration, you know, what's, what's going on and the terrible behavior of, of uh, Zimri ben Salu and his, his, his gang, that's true too, but they're also looking at a religious society and they, uh, they want to contend with the ever-present risk of fanaticism. And I think that they have bequeathed to us a religion that, that is... Um, that is uh, at arm's length to fanaticism and wants to restrain fanaticism and considers that to be a real threat, as I think, of course, uh, we should nowadays. So I, I, when, as you're speaking, both of you, I'm reminded by, I think it's a quote of Rabbi Adin Steinzalt, Sichuan Livracha, who, who said, you know, he was, he was talking about the curriculum of, of Israel and how it was so focused on Tanakh, so focused on the Bible, he says, when we teach Tanakh to, to our, our students, we make them into little prophets, right? He said, we should focus more on, on teaching Talmud because that is exactly the, 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 the spirit of moderation, the spirit of dialogue, the spirit of argument and, and resolution. And, says when, when, and I think this is what, you know, I, I would reframe what you're saying, Jeremy, and says that, that what, what is so um, volatile about this passage is that it presents a, a, an emulatable model for a person in, let's say, your community, our community, my community, anybody who sees something wrong happening, takes the law into their own hands, literally the spear, and, and does what he thinks is right in his mind. And, and, and the rabbis are very, very sensitive to this. They're very aware of this possibility. I think all of us are sensitive because we, we live in an environment in which we, you know, we see the proclivity to fanatical behavior all over the place. It's, it's, I mean, you can't be more right than when you're right. You know? So I, I want to add a, a slightly different nuance. I may have mentioned this before, but there was an exchange of letters between Gandhi and Martin Buber in the 30s. Gandhi, the great apostle of uh, civil disobedience and passive resistance, wanted the Jews of Europe to respond with nonviolence to the Nazis. And Buber writes back to him, my dear Mahatma, the tragedy of being human is sometimes war must be fought. And I think that that bears on our situation. I think looking ahead, we cannot sanction pinterest like behavior, but there are situations where it is appropriate. And after the fact, we might think we're taking the high moral ground by reproving him, but I'm not so sure that that's the case. So I just want to point out, by the way, with respect to his, to his kehuna, um, to, to read in a, a different halakha, but, um, uh, but uh, one that's relevant, which is, you know, Isaiah says, um, 
you know, that I will, I will hide my eyes from your prayer because your hands are full of blood. The ancient prayer gesture was to lift up the hands and your, your hands are full of blood. And so um, when we do Nisiyat Kapayim, the rule is that a Kohen Shaharag, Kohen that killed somebody, is not eligible to give the Birkat Kohanim. Now, this guy gives interesting questions to the fact that, uh, you know, virtually every uh, Israeli citizen has been in the army and, uh, and may well have literally engaged in homicide. The, 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 the Psaac Dean is that, yes, you can still, act, your service in Sahal does not uh, invalidate you, but having killed somebody, even, you know, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think the ruling has come down that even if like, you kill somebody in an auto accident, you can't say Birkata Kohanim. And so I would imagine, just to, just to sort of riff on Pinchas for a moment, maybe let's let's even grant, even though I'm not really agreeing with you, but let's even grant your position right that it had to be done. The tragic outcome might be that you uh, you you don't get to give Birkata Kohanim anymore, um, even if you did this. The the uh, this is one little orthographic figure, but feature of this, by the way, is that the vav in the phrase, you know. The here you know ten of Briti Shalom. I give him the I give him a covenant of peace. Bob and Shalom is split. There's like a there's a Broken little God. line through a little blank line in the as if to say that that spear is broken. And and I find that quite beautiful. So okay, so it's a problematic passage, it's a problematic figure and a and a model. We move from that uh, little little paragraph to another census of the people. The census is different in terms of both the data and in terms of some of the personalities that are mentioned. And um, for example, uh, you know, the, the Torah will tell us some, a little bit of family history. It'll give us a mention of Datan Vaviram. It tells us, and we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago um, with regard to um, uh, but the, uh, when, when it talks about the death of Datan Aviram, it also adds as a footnote, Uvne Korach Lometu, the children of Korach, the sons of Korach did not die. It goes back to um, when it talks about the family of Judah, Vayamot, Erva Onan, Beretz Kanan. We're getting little pieces of information here in addition to uh, somewhat of a difference in the census. Barry, can you take us into some of the differences that uh, we have here um, and, and maybe, you know, try and, and, and share here what is going on, what's going on in this passage. So I would preface my remarks with a comment. When I was in Israel many, many years ago on kibbutz, there was a kid, I think it was 11 or 12 years old, whose name was Guni. Now, as you can imagine, Guni is not a name that would travel well to the United States, <laughs> but he pointed out that it was actually the name of the Nasi and the tribe of Naphtali, which is mentioned in the Parsha this week. So it's always interesting to think about names and what gives currency to a name in one language and not in another. But what's striking in this sense is, first of all, one has to pay attention to the numbers. There are a few of the tribes that grow extraordinarily and a few that are diminished extraordinarily, and that's always important. But there are some other anomalies. There are, by my count, exactly eight women who are mentioned. And granted, none of these eight women are properly part of the census, which is the census of fighting men. But we have the five daughters of Slovchad, which we'll figure in a story later in the Parsha and again in next week's Parsha. We have Yocheved mentioned as the wife of Amram and the mother of Aaron, Moshe, and Miriam, their sister. And that in itself is interesting that it says that Yochavet gave birth to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and yet Miriam had to be identified as their sister, which led me to think that perhaps she's identified as a sister because unlike most women, when they themselves get married, they become part of the husband's household. Miriam always maintained her connection to her parents' household and was identified as the daughter of Amram and Yocheved more than as the wife of her husband and his tribe. Um, the last woman that's mentioned is this curious figure, Sarah, who is the daughter of Asher, and she appears only a couple times in the Bible with nothing more than her name, which isn't even spelled the same way throughout. And that, you know, as the rabbis like to say, means Darshani. We have to interpret it. 
but I don't have a good interpretation other than to say that there are these details that are hanging around in the ancient world as uh, our ancestors are living their lives in what we call the biblical period, and they can't let go of them. Well, the rabbis do have a beautiful midrash with Sarah Parashar. You know, at the beginning of the Exodus, you're familiar with this one, of course, the, when, when uh, Moses is entrusted with rest, taking the bones of Joseph, uh, evidently Sarah is still alive. She must be, you know, well into her hundreds. And she, she knows literally where the bones are buried. And she, she's the one that tells uh, Moses where to get the bones. And, and um, you know, this, uh, she becomes an archetype for the, the bearer of communal knowledge. And that is not an accident that it, it falls primarily onto women in the imagination of the rabbis and probably in folklore and probably in customs and communities to this very day where women preserve institutional communal memory uh, to an extent that I think is very, very significant. Uh, you're familiar with that one, okay. So let, let's go on. The, 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 you know, we, we read these, these passages and, and they are uh, filled with data. Uh, I, I love the romantic uh, interpretation that, that says, you know, this is part of the, the national song. But part of the national song also includes this moment where uh, the daughters of Tzalafchad appear before uh, Moshe because there are five of them and their father Tzalafchad does not have any children and they want uh, an inheritance. Uh, Jeremy, pick up the story there. Uh, who are these, these daughters? What are they doing? And can you give us maybe a, a sentence or two on the, uh, the generation of Jewish law here as it uh, is appearing in this uh, passage. I think that's worth a whole lecture. Yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. Chapter 27 is, is these, uh, this, this wonderful, basically somebody files, somebody files an appeal at the Supreme Court about the, uh, about the distribution of property law. Uh, this is clearly obviously a patriarchal kind of society. Uh, the, the power is concentrated in the males and you know, in the way, some of the ways that, ba that Barry said, um, you know, the, uh, the, the story is just going to marginalize the female participant. And it's just a feature of the Torah uh, coming from that, the world in which it was, which it was originally emerged that uh, males inherit. Okay, so uh, if, if you're going to distribute the, the share of one's estate, you know, you, let's just say you have three male children, uh, the firstborn gets, to, you, you divide the share into four, the firstborn gets a double share, and everybody else gets one share. But what happens if there's uh, what happens if there's no sons? Okay, so the daughters of Slopkod come along and say, um, "Well, you know, our father died in the wilderness, and he was not. By the way, he wasn't one of the Karak people. Just don't think he was one of the Karak people. Those guys were bad news. Uh, he died in his own sin, and for that, the rabbis uh, make an, a little midrashic extrapolation that he is the guy who a couple of parshiot ago." Uh, from Bahalotcha was was gathering sticks on Shabbat, and that's that's why that's why Tzlopcha died. Uh, but he's got no sons, and what are we going to do about the property? Which, by the way, we care about our ancestral uh, holding. I'm, I'm being a little anachronistic when I say we care about our holding. The Torah is imagining that there will be a distribution, and and when that happens, this is what they will care about. Uh, obviously, it hasn't happened yet. They haven't entered the land yet. Um, and Moshe has to, to check it out with the boss upstairs who says, they say, they say correctly. Um, or if you want to be a little poetic, maybe say, they say yes. That's like being Obama line, right? You know, you could totally hear, you could totally hear, uh, yes, we can. Um, and so the, we get a, a chidush halacha, a new, a new legislation in this parasha, which is not exactly feminist. Because it doesn't mean, you know, what you're right. Let's let's change the inheritance law such that sons and daughters inherit equally. No, 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 no. The chidush, the new innovation, is that in the absence of sons, daughters can also inherit. If there are sons, the sons inherit. So, right. what, what we see here, not only in terms of in terms of actual content, in terms of the specific laws, but we see an approach. I, Barry, I, I, you know, I want to I want to bring you in here in terms of, you know, what is this this story telling us about the approach of, of biblical law and Jewish law. And really, I guess, could you say that it's kindling the idea that 
Law is going to develop. Law is not static. Uh, you're muted, so unmute yourself. Yeah, go. Unmute, there. I think I've mentioned this before. When we read a book, the book is in black and white, and we, we, off, and we often don't get the, the color of life as it is lived. And so the tradition, of course, is Moses received the entire written and oral law on Mount Sinai. But as the Torah makes clear here and in other passages, there are still many questions that remain about what the law is or how to apply the law. And what's striking to me is in the verse that Jeremy quoted that God says, well, of course they're right. And it makes you wonder if, of course, they're right, either A, why did not God provide for this law already? Or B, why was Moses not more sensitive to this situation? We were talking before the show. I find it mind-boggling that there is one case of Benot Slovchad. We yeah. just had our census of 600,000-odd 600, fighting men. You would think that there were lots of families that only had women, and they also would be concerned about the family inheritance, and yet there's no story. But I think for our purposes is that it, it always does us well to think of the Bible as a lived tradition, that people are going through their lives, their daily lives, their national lives, and to try and imagine what it would be like if you have a question like this. Yeah. Who do you go to? Where do you get it answered? And here they go to Moses with what seems to be a reasonable question. Moses says, let me check. He goes to God and God says, of course, it's reasonable. And, you know, you were talking about it not being such a feminist reading. It is quite an elaboration of ancestral, of hereditary law that follows their simple request that we should get the land because it provides for every possible permutation of when the when there fails to be a male. If you don't have any brothers, you don't have any uncles, you don't have any great uncles, what's gonna to happen to this land? Because in a part that we haven't gotten to, the, the allocation of the land is really central to the Israelite enterprise. You know, we forget the Torah is really a prelude to life in the land. All right, so now, so now that, that story is gonna be suspended and we're gonna to go to, briefly to a, a, a very important moment in the, in the transition of the, the Torah, really. Uh, this is now Moses being told that he's going to die and that uh, that era is going to end. It's really a remarkable passage. God says to Moses, go up to this mountain, Mount Abarim, look at the land, Look at the land. Then you're going to die. You're going to be gathered to your kin. You, just as your brother has died. And then gives the, you know, a, another statement of the reason. But, but we don't want to focus on, on the, the, the reason for Moses' death. We want to focus on the, the passage immediately after this. Moses without being told by God, then says to God, let the Lord of all of the winds, all of the spirits, um, appoint someone. And, and um, here we, we can talk about how, talk about transition. And, and, and in, in general, what is going on in the transition of leadership? Why is this such an important moment. And what is Moses' role here? And, and do you give Moses a check mark here? You, you have plus or minus on Moses here. We, we were critical on Moses a couple of weeks ago, but uh, you're giving a double thumbs up. Jeremy, talk, take it from you. I'm going to give two, two full hands because, <laughs> because uh, you know, it, it, there's a way in which uh, anybody who's read the book of Deuteronomy knows that it's like not one of these things is not like the others. Okay. Um, Deuteronomy is its own distinct vocabulary. It's its own distinct set of concerns. It doesn't appear to be, you know, it's not by the Baradon Adonai or Moshe Lemur. It's not got an omniscient narrator, Moses is the speaker throughout. Um, and, and Moshe, uh, in, in the end of Bamidbar, it looks like, it looks like we could have had a, 
instead of a chumash, a ravua. Like we could have had a four, we could have had a four book Bible uh, instead of a five book Bible. If, if it ended here, uh, it ended at the end of end of Numbers, at the edge of the land, without that big long speech. And and we are coming to, uh, you know, f- for us in the annual cycle of the Torah reading, the book of then the book of Numbers is not the end of the Torah, but it could have been the end of the Torah. And Moshe is being ushered out. We, we last week we had the the very moving deaths of, of Aaron, the somewhat glossed over death of Miriam, but uh, two weeks ago in, in, in uh, Hukat. Um, but here, uh, Moshe is called upon to look at this flock and say, they need somebody in my place because I know I'm not going. They can't be like a shepherd, a sheep that has no shepherd. So God, you have to, you have to help us out here. And God says to Moshe, you, that, that wonderful prayer, as Elliot said, about the uh, the you, you, you have to know how, how Ruach and Basar go together. You have to know these people are flesh and blood and they have spirit. How do we, how do we lead them? Not, not as, a, as a sheep that have no shepherd. So God says, listen, here's what we're going to do. We had a, we had a good guy, Joshua. He's done, a lot, he's done a lot beforehand. He fought the Amalekites. He helped you in the tent and he, uh, he helped you in the camp and he, what else did he do? He was a good spy in, in, the, uh, in the episode of the Miraglim. So here's what I'd like you to do. You should lay your hand on him. And the Torah is clear that it's, it's a singular term. Uh, uh, place your hand, single hand on him. And then Moses, in fact, and you should give Natata Mehodecha, give him some of your authority. But then Moses, in an act of great generosity, stands up there and does as the Lord commanded him, he takes Joshua and he lays his hands, plural, on him, a greater act of generosity and, and affirmation than perhaps even God had asked for. So I read Moshe here as, you know, not feeling jealous, not feeling anxious, not, he's, he's not the guy who wants his successor to, like, I'd like you to succeed, just, just not as much as me. No, right, at this moment, Moshe is not that guy. He says, I want you to just soar, baby. You know, it's funny, the, the, the late John, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs has a line that he says, um, you know, good leaders have, make followers. Great leaders make leaders. And, and um, it's, it's very interesting that, that, and the rabbis pick up on this, Rashi certainly comes, that he's not, he doesn't have jealousy of Joshua, although, although Moses can come off certainly very, very passionate. Um, but what he's, what he's doing is, imparting something and he's giving Joshua the legitimacy of leadership in front of the people. He takes Joshua in front of Eleazar and the entire uh, community and really presents him, gives him the greatest gift of all that, that a leader as great as Moses could give to a successor, which is you are going to function, you are going to be around. I'm, I am giving you the, the, the sense of legitimacy uh, before, before everyone with the acknowledgement that a new generation is going to need a new, a new leader, a new style, a new way of everything. It's never going to be the same. It's never going to be past. And, and here again, this is how transitions, especially transitions in leadership are, are so sensitive. We, we just watched Israel go through this period of, of transition where a long standing, you know, prime minister, you know, kicking and screaming. I think that would be light. You know, is you know giving up power, um, and but Naftali Bennett is is a kind of successor figure. Certainly, you know, at, at one point was a protege, worked in you know in the in the in inner sanctum, inner circle of Netanyahu, and um, let's just say it, 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 there was no legitimacy given uh, to to succession, and and you know here you know I think. Um, uh, with the United States here, man, there's yeah. some some very significant percentage of the United States population does not think that President Biden won that election because the predecessor did absolutely everything he could to say, is, no, I, it's me, it's me, it's only me, it's only going to ever be me, it's got to be me. Okay, so so, but in the United States, it's a, it's it's not. I mean, I wouldn't. It's in Israel. It's also not dynastic. Okay, you know, but. Um, the, the, the idea that transit here, the idea that transition is a sensitive moment, I mean, is, you know, we saw that in spades uh, 
back in, in January and February and, and beyond. Very well, I want to draw our attention to the imagery in the passage. So the imagery is of a shepherd and a flock, and Moses' greatness is intimately linked up with him being a shepherd. Yes. That's how he gets his start, and the rabbis elaborate on it. You know, he is concerned for the lost sheep, shows God that he will be a, a wonderful leader for B'nai Israel. Joshua is not a shepherd. You know, we think of Joshua as a warrior, and whatever else we think of Moses, we don't really think of Moses as a warrior. In the one battle that he's described and participating in with Amalek, his function was merely to have his hands held up so that the Israelites could be victorious. But the image of God as a shepherd and us as a flock give us, gives us some insight into the difference between God and us. Right, the sheep can never become the shepherd. What Moses represents for the people is this unique leader who can never be replaced as that leader. There's gonna be a person that's gonna follow him, in this case, Joshua is gonna be a, a great warrior and gonna be a brilliant leader. And then as we follow the rest of the Bible, there are gonna be good leaders and bad leaders, but they're never gonna be a shepherd again because the people are now in a different place that they're never going back to. Moses has done his job. He has brought them to the edge of the river that he cannot cross. And he has provided a leader who can be successful in their venture across the river. Absolutely. And that, that you know, will, will remain one of his most significant achievements. Okay, so now we have, we, have, we don't have time to really go through the, 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 the second half of the Parsha, which is, <laughs> A significant part of the Parsha, but it's familiar to us because we read each one of these passages at different times during the year, whether it's on Shabbat, well, you know, in the Musaf, or as part of the Musaf um, and part of the Maftirs of every uh, different holiday. What is this passage, if you can just tell us briefly, what's it doing here, what's, what's it about, and, and what does it mean for us? Uh, Rabbi Kamalowski, you want to take a shot at this? Or a slash? <laughs> a I'll, take a, I'll take a knife across the throat to this, and uh, uh, you know, you, you say why? Why is it? Uh, what is this passage? Here, I, it's it's. I don't know exactly why it's in here, but um, you. When we were talking before we started recording, you you said it's, it's like a, a kind of a manual. This is the holiday cycle. It doesn't mean that there isn't other things to say about the holidays, but this passage has nothing to say at the holidays except sacrificial details. There isn't any reason for the holiday. There isn't anything you're supposed to feel. There isn't any, any you know, sort of moral or historical consciousness. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt or, or celebrate the new, you know, celebrate the new uh, crop or whatever. This is just, this is what we do in the, the temple sacrifice. And you can, um, you can learn uh, a number of interesting, like sort of details of the religious conception of how does the, the sacrifice, such as you know why why it, why it is the different holidays, di different uh, sacrifices on different days, how they include grains, how it has meat and grains and wine. Um, there's a whole there's a whole combination of of food groups there, I guess. Um, but you showed us a picture of the temple. I mean, this is this is about you know, the apparatus of, of a state, right? The state celebration, the national, this is the national celebration of the festivals with national, you know, configurations of offering. I mean, it's, a, it's quite a pageant. And of course, you know, as Judaism develops well into the, into, from the biblical period into the temple period, this is, this is what it's all about. It, it's, it's foreign to our own understanding of religion, but, uh, uh, let's just say it's a big deal, eh? <laughs> oh, it's a big deal, eh? You know, there's lots of animals. There's lots and lots of animals, including, you know, people are going to offer their own individual, their own individual sin offerings, their own individual Thanksgiving offerings, but it must have been just quite a slaughterhouse. Yeah, so the, the temple is meant to be an eternal institution, and I think there's a nice uh, point, there's a poignancy to reading this the when we begin the three weeks it's difficult for us in the 21st century 
to imagine what life must have been with the temple because we've never known such a life and no one going way back has ever known such a life. But for our ancestors who lived when the temple stood, the temple was permanent. It was as secure as the foundations of the world. And part of the tragedy that we are commemorating with these three weeks is losing that sense of permanence. And what compounds the tragedy, it seems to me sometimes, is that we are so far removed, we don't even realize it's a tragedy anymore. That's right. We it's just right. liberalize. It's a great observation in, in a couple of ways. I just want to, I want to just, you know, I, I just want to, you know, pick up and, and affirm what you just said. It, it didn't even occur to me right now until we just started talking. You said that, that uh, here we are on the 17th of Tammuz and on one of the, uh, you know, one of the the things that happened on the 17th of Tammuz is that they ran out of sheep in, in apparently in a, in a course of a Hasmonean civil war, although it's perhaps in the first temple. Um, they ran out of sheep to offer on the Tamid, the daily Tamid. And so the absence of the sacrificial system is one of the things that is encoded in today's event. Um, and so he, here we are, we can think about that, that sense of absence. The other thing I wanted to say, you know, eternal as the, as the foundation of the world itself, you know, we, we call the, the big golden dome, Kipat Hasela, the, the dome of the rock, the rock, there's a big gigantic piece of bedrock there that, that Amir, I mean, I've never been inside the, I've never been on the Temple Mount because of, uh, I've always frankly wanted to avoid it because uh, I have the sense that that could be Beit Kodesh or Kodeshim, I don't want to go there. Um, but there is this big gigantic rock and it is, you know, the rock that, that Abraham bound Isaac to and it's the, it is Evan Shtia, it is, it is in Jewish mythology and I guess Islamic mythology also you know, the foundation stone of the world. So the temple really was for these folks, uh, a connection with not just, you know, here's our cultural practice, but this is rooted in the world itself. It was essential, essential. So, okay, so with that, we, we, we've come to a conclusion on this part. So, you know, the, the, a personality, beginning with a personality that is entrusted with some of this apparatus, uh, again, through the movement of, of the, the people, the transition of power and the the whole manual for worship. I mean, it's a full parsha, a full amazing parsha, uh, and uh, we've come to our conclusion of our parsha talk. We want to thank you all for listening and watching. A special shout out to our friends at Machanenu, Machane Raman, the Berkshires, listening to us. We hope you enjoyed this. We're wishing everyone a beautiful, beautiful Shabbat. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Parsha talk.